Hello and welcome to Weekend Watch Repair. My name is Adam. Thanks for joining me here today. On the bench today is a really cool Seiko Sea Lion M55 Week Dater from May of 1967. I was thinking about future videos for this channel and what kind of watches I'd be working on. And I thought it'd be fun to do a series on affordable vintage watches. Something that doesn't cost a lot of money to get in, but still makes a fun project to rebuild. I think a lot of these watches have a, a bunch of character, and I know this is only my third video on the channel, and thus far, all of them have been Seiko watches. And truth be told, I'm a big Seiko fan, especially older Seikos. But there's other brands also that I think will also fit into the same category. But again, I think this is something a lot more attainable for a lot of people, myself included, considering I'm purchasing these watches myself. But I thought it'd just be a fun project to see some of these watches that normally aren't featured too often. But with that said, we can get down to the video. And you saw me take off the bracelet. And here I'm just showing you the state of the case that it, as it, I received it in. It's pretty dirty. There's a lot of dirt wedged in to the case back. And uh, it, I can tell it's been quite some time since this watch has last been opened. Uh, most of it is, you know, just surface dirt, it cleans off pretty easily. Here I'm removing the second spring bar and I really wanted to show you all this clip so you could really see just how filthy this thing was. It uh, It's seen a lot of service and not a lot of cleaning. And now I'm expanding that bracelet out and that thing is just absolutely filthy. It, um, th it cleaned up in the end and I actually ended up putting this thing on a strap at the end of the video. Uh, but uh, that thing did clean up beautifully once it was all done, but I, that was something else. So here I'm just using some peg wood to just clean up a lot of the loose stuff on the surface. Uh, just because when I open it up, I, I, I try my best to avoid getting as much of it inside the movement as I can before I start. And you can see I, I'm not even wearing finger cots here when I'm taking it apart because it's all going to get cleaned anyway. It really doesn't matter. At least I don't think so at this point. But I loosened the case back on the machine and then I just used the little magic eight ball there from Bergeon. And now we get a chance to take a look at this movement. I put a little bit of a wind in it just to start, um, probably six or eight revolutions, not a full wind, but I just kind of wanted to get a base reading on the time grapher. And, it, you know, these results aren't terribly discouraging. I mean, it is running very fast and it has a pretty good size beat error. And the amplitude's low, but it is filthy. But the lines are parallel, and, and that's a good sign. Uh, I think the watch is definitely serviceable. So inside here on the case back, you can kind of see this watch has had some history. Uh, looking at those closely, I've, the one that actually had a date on it was 1999. So uh, at, at least this watch was serviced 24 years ago. And we're going to begin here by removing the screw and the oscillating weight on the back of the movement. After that's out of the way, then we can begin by removing the automatic winding works. There is three screws holding this assembly in place. And this is another one uh, that uses the magic lever system that uh, same one that was in my earlier videos on the Pogue. Uh, the setup is a little bit different, but mechanically it's basically the same using a transmission wheel and a magic lever to, uh, to facilitate the automatic winding of the watch here. I'll flip this thing over here so you can get a good view of that. Uh, it's again, just a little bit different configuration and there's tons of different ones, but uh, it, that system works so well. Next up, I'm using my spring bar tool to depress the setting lever spring screw, I think is what it's called, and uh, removing the crown and stem. First thing I notice here is that the, uh, the stem is missing the gasket and you can definitely see some discoloration and uh, surface degradation on that, on that stem. Most of it is just on the surface. Uh, it cleans up nice, but I'm not able to get the color back. So next I'm releasing tension on the click spring and remo removing the wind from the watch just by rotating that uh, barrel and ratchet wheel assembly around. And I'll let that wind down. Once it's wound down, we begin by removing these two case clamp screws. On this particular watch, in case the uh, the, these two screws that I'm removing here are uh, clamped down onto the uh, movement spacer. 
um, the movement ring inside the watch. So these have to come out before that movement ring can come out. And as I take that last screw out, this movement ring was really stuck in place with a bunch of caked up dirt and uh, debris. It, 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 it took a good amount of very, very gentle persuasion to, uh, to get it to come out. But once it's out of the way, then you can see that old case back gasket and the terrible shape that it's in. But now that that's all out of the way, we can remove the watch from the case. So um, flipping it around here and trying to get it somewhat centered in the camera view. Um, but uh, we just tap on a little bit and off it comes. And the first thing you can see is there is a lot of, the first thing I noticed here is, I mean, there, there's a lot of um, stuff on the dial. And uh, as we can tell, there, there was no, no gasket on the stem. And uh, I mean, the, the integrity of the case had, had been compromised for quite some time. So I was just using a little bit of Rodico there just to see if it picks up or not. And a lot of it did. So uh, I think it's still serviceable. So we remove the hands just by placing some plastic on there to protect the dial. And uh, we just remove the hands being very careful to make sure that none of the hands come off with the plastic. So there's two dial feet screws that uh, we are loosening. And once that's up, we can remove the dial from the watch. And uh, when I picked it up here, there's a movement or dial spacer that came off with it that I'll separate here so you can take a look. And another thing I noticed here is um, as I'm kind of going through this quick little montage of storing all those, the dial and uh, hands is that there was no uh, dial spacer when we removed the dial. There should have been a, a, uh, a dial washer, not a dial spacer, but a dial washer on top of the day wheel that sits between that and the dial. And it was missing from this watch. So there's another part we had to source. And we're going to begin disassembly here by removing the day wheel. I'll just do that with a piece of Rodico. Uh, there is no clip on this one that holds it down. But once that's out of the way, we're going to begin by removing this cover plate. This particular cover plate I'm removing that has these two screws uh, acts as a holder to keep that date wheel in place. It, it captures uh, the teeth on that day wheel as it moves around. So you can't remove that wheel without first removing that cover plate. And there's a little bit of oil on there and you can see those screws kind of sticking to my, my tweezers. The next up here is I'm removing this plate here. Now I'm not removing the screws entirely. I'm just loosening them because this has the mother of all springs that want to fly into outer space. So I just partially loosen those screws and then remove tension on this, uh, day jumper spring. Uh, the, once the tension's released on it, then I'll finish removal of the two screws holding the plate down. Once those screws are out of the way, actually what I'm doing here is I'm comparing the screws from this plate to the plate that we previously removed just to see if they are the same. And in this case they are, but I just want to make sure in case they were different that I stored them accordingly and I didn't, uh, mix up the two. So I'll flip this plate over here and, uh, I change camera angles here in a minute where you can kind of see the recess that that spring sits inside. And um, it, it's nerve wracking putting that thing in because those springs fly so easily and they are so incredibly tiny. They'll stick to your shirt and you'll never know it. Uh, you know, they'll, it, it, it demands your full attention uh, when you're um, working on movements that have the, uh, that particular setup. So now we're removing the uh, assembly to, for the uh, date wheel setting assembly. Uh, that's the date wheel setting spring. We remove the tension on that. And then once that's out of the way, we can remove the, uh, the setting lever itself. If you happen to watch the disassembly or reassembly of the Pogue videos, you can definitely see that it's a completely different setup that accomplishes the same task as, uh, that old one had the, uh, the setting lever and the spring all, all in one part. But, uh, this one here, it's all, all separate components. So this is the day setting lever itself. And the screw that I'm messing with here, uh, unsuccessfully is unique to that part. It's, it, it has a shoulder on it and kind of a uniquely rounded head. The, the edges of the, of the screw head are radiused a little bit. It's very similar to that, uh, cover plate that, uh, is covering the minute wheel there at like the three thirty position on the, on the photo. Those two, sc do, those two screws will interchange with one another and screw into the other slots, but the heads are different and they need to be, um, in their individual slots. So if you are working on this particular movement, make sure you don't uh, 
confuse those two. So next we're removing the calendar works. And this one here is very similar to the, uh, to the one on the, on the previous video, uh, just a very few parts. I was, uh, that is two pieces there that didn't want to separate because there's oil between them. So right now I'm just, uh, going to remove the intermediate wheel and you can see those two sets of gears where it interacts with that date driving wheel and the, uh, the, uh, the hour wheel. So once we get those two parts separated from the calendar works here, we're just going to remove those two wheels. That's the date driving wheel being removed. Next up, we're removing the cover plate for the minute wheel. And this is that plate I just mentioned just a moment ago, where that spring is very similar to the date driving wheel or the date. Yeah. The date driving lever, uh, screw, but uh, they are different. And, uh, just, um, make sure that, um, you, you remember that if you're working on one of these two. So I'm just kind of taking a look here. Uh, there's, you can definitely see some wear marks and, uh, some dried up lubrication on that, on that cover plate. So next we're going to take the cannon pinion removal tool and just, uh, simply remove the cannon pinion. Uh, normally I, I'm dropping it down here just so you can kind of get a good look at what that cannon pinion looks like. Once that's out of the way, and then we can remove the minute wheel. Uh, note to self, uh, I was, you know, I, I was kind of hungry <laughs> when I was doing this. So I've got a little bit of the shakes I've noticed as I'm, as I'm watching this video. And when I was doing editing, there's sections of it where my hands are steady and sections of it where they aren't. And I can definitely, I can remember when I was working on those, um, uh, in those moments and I was, I was hungry or something. And, uh, so yeah, like right there, I mean, I've, I've got the, I've got the shakes here, which I'm sure a lot of you folks here, if you're, if you like to tinker with watches as I do, you have those moments as well. So, yeah, and you can definitely see that part there was, um, pretty filthy. So, uh, next we're removing the, um, setting lever spring and that setting lever spring also acts as a cover plate for the yoke and the yoke spring. So next up, we are going to remove the yoke spring. I'm just kind of using, a you know, a, my little plastic tool here just to kind of hold that spring down in place while I remove tension on it. Uh, that's a pretty stout little spring. Um, you know, we, we say springs are really strong and I mean, they're strong when you compare it to other springs inside of it. it's a really terribly weak spring in, in all reality, but for a watch, it's a very strong spring and it will ping off pretty far if you give it the opportunity. Next up here, we are removing the screw for the setting lever axle spring. Um, this part here that that screw holds down is what, uh, puts tension on that, um, on that setting lever. And, uh, so when you depress the, the release, it, it, it pushes back in place. So I'm just comparing this screw to the um, setting lever spring uh, screw that we removed earlier, just to show the difference between that two. That other one uh, holds down the um, the cover plate for the uh, the quick set mechanism as well, and so it's got a shoulder on it. But I I just wanted to show you all uh, the difference between those. So uh, with that out of the way, uh, we're finally just removing the setting lever itself. And once that's done, we can remove our stem again. Again, this stem here has, um, has definitely got some corrosion on it, but I, th I think it's, it, it, it's, it came out pretty well in, in the end. And finally, we're just removing the clutch wheel. And that is just about everything on the dial side outside of, uh, jewels. So we're going to begin here on the back side of the watch by removing the balance. Balance here is held in by one screw. If the, this is, if you don't watch a lot of these videos and this is the, you know, the, the, You've seen my other ones. You remember my, uh, the earlier videos with the Pogue that, that particular balance had uh, two screws, uh, and that bit bridge spanned across that balance assembly here. Typically speaking, uh, if I understand the terminology correctly, when a bridge is held on by one screw, um, and it goes out, it's actually, they call it a cock. And usually when there's two screws mounting it or it spans the assembly, it's called a bridge. Um, so, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to call this a bridge, but, uh, I mean, I think everybody else does, but, but I don't know if I'm 100% using the actual correct terminology, but once that balance is out of the way here, we're going to do a close up shot on that. So you can just take a look at the, the spring and see that the, I was checking that the rings are concentric and, um, you know, at first glance, everything looks good. Um, we'll do a little bit of work on that later. But uh, next we're removing the ratchet wheel. Uh, first off by removing the ratchet wheel screw. And with that screw out of the way, we can remove the ratchet wheel itself. Uh, a lot of times you'll see a whole lot of dirt on that uh, barrel bridge 
when you remove that ratchet wheel, but uh, wait till we remove that bridge and you'll see something pretty, pretty spectacular or spectacularly awful. But um, we removed the click and the click spring. I just pulled them apart as a single unit and now we are removing the barrel bridge. You know, I'm thinking about how I'm editing these videos and I'm trying to show, you know, every single screw, every single everything coming on and off. But it also kind of creates a, a difficulty when uh, doing the narration for these videos because you have to fill the void with something, I, th I think. I mean, I, I don't know, would you guys just want dead silence in between all this, you know, as I'm removing these screws, it, um, you know, I, do you enjoy seeing that content or you, would you rather me just be quiet? You know, just let me know because I'm, I'm learning as I go. Uh, I know I'm not as polished as a lot of the, uh, some of the other folks who make these videos. So uh, I appreciate your feedback on that. So we removed this bridge and now you can see all that dirt where that barrel was. That is, uh, that's pretty kicked on there. Uh, that, that thing is, it, you know, Th that one's up there in terms of the amount of uh, dried up grease I've seen uh, during disassembly on a watch. So uh, beginning here by removing the fifth wheel and I'm just uh, checking the pivots and the overall condition of these wheels. Next up here, we are removing the third wheel on this watch. And you can see this setup is really similar to that uh, 6319 movement we serviced on the Pogue. Uh, the gear train is, I mean, spectacularly close uh, to one another. Uh, but uh, with that third wheel, wheel removed out of the way, and then we can remove the barrel assembly itself. We'll uh, take that apart and separate it out here in a bit. But with that out of the way, then we can begin by removing the center wheel bridge. Uh, this bridge is held on by one screw. And uh, on these movements, too, if you notice that bridge, that screw has kind of had a rounded top. And if you look at the pallet fork bridge, that screw's got a very flat top. Other than the tops of those screws, they're basically identical. But... You don't want to mix those two screws up because with that balance wheel spinning underneath that pallet fork, you need that screw to sit flat and low and that screw kind of countersinks into that bridge. So while that pallet fork screw would work, if you put it on the center wheel bridge, the center wheel bridge screw could possibly rub against the balance if you swap those two. So make sure that you keep those two screws separated. But with the pallet fork bridge out of the way, we're removing the pallet fork itself and I'm just kind of taking a look here just to make sure that the pivots on that are in good shape. And then we remove the center wheel or second wheel, depending upon what you want to call it. So I pause it right here. I'm sure a lot of you guys saw that, um, you know, I, I, I didn't show the removal of that uh, setting lever pin there. It did get removed. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and that's always the one part that you, you kind of forget about, especially during reassembly too. So um, here we're removing the automatic works and I went ahead and loosened the screws already. If, uh, you know, uh, before I did that, I, I do have to save time in this video somewhere. I didn't want it to be two hours long. So I do show all the screws coming out, but not all the, I don't all the time, you know, show me actually screwing them down or unscrewing them. But we removed the cover plate for the paw lever and the transmission wheel. And uh, that's the transmission wheel coming out. And that's the paw lever coming out. And my the little airplane animation. I, <laughs> I'm liking these, uh, these animations in this video editing software. I'm kind of playing with them. So I hope you'll, you'll be bear with me as I, I kind of play around here with those. You'll, you'll see some of those from time to time. So we are going to separate out, separate this, uh, barrel assembly here. This one doesn't look too terribly bad. Uh, again, that's Seiko's S4 grease, uh, that black grease. So it looks a lot worse than it is, but, uh, we remove the arbor and I set this arbor here so you can kind of see the hook on the edge of that arbor that interacts with that mainspring. There's a really good view of it later when uh, we reinstall the mainspring. I, I got a really good shot of that hook in there, uh, but I really wanted you, you all to see that. So here I'm just doing my best to um, not let this spring fly completely out of the barrel as I'm removing it. But I kind of do a little bit of fast forward action here, here in just a second, here we go. And uh, that way you don't have to bear with me watching me disassemble this in real time. So once that's out of the way, we begin inspection before main cleaning. And a, uh, a hint here is uh, if you turn off your lights and then put a like a shine a flashlight or something from underneath the part, it makes inspecting the jewels a lot easier. And you can see cracks and uh, all kinds of fun stuff. So here, I'm just going to be quiet here. I'm just uh, doing a little bit of um, prep work on the jewels here. So I'll be quiet and let this uh, let this go.
Okay, hope you enjoyed that. I uh, kind of threw a little, <laughs> a little bit of thing in there. I thought it was pretty funny. I uh, hope you don't mind. So here, uh, something I noticed during disassembly here, the uh, the weight itself on the oscillating weight is uh, being separated uh, here. And uh, this thing is uh, punched together or crimped together. So uh, I already crimped the other side, but basically I have a spade shaped uh, tool in my staking set here. And uh, you know, I, I didn't, couldn't think of another way to fix this. So I just, I figured I'd give it a shot. I, this may not even be the correct way to do it. And uh, some of you, of you folks out there who have a lot more experience than I am, you're, you know, you're either going to roast me or uh, say I did it correctly, but uh, I look forward to hearing from you either way. Um, but um, that, that last one wasn't that all that great. But uh, you can see here at the end, it, um, it is secure again. And uh, you know, I have a little uh, photo of it here on the other side, uh, just to show that, I mean, it didn't mark it really on the other side every everything kind of worked out well in the end and that thing is no longer loose. So to begin the assembly process after everything's been cleaned, uh, first off by getting the barrel assembly sorted. So on that last watch, you noticed I, uh, I, I reused the S4 grease when we uh, relubricated the uh, sidewalls for the, for the barrel. I'm not using that here. I'm, uh, th this is Mobius 8217, uh, which I also find works really well. Um, so here I'm, we're reusing the original mainspring on here. Um, I'm getting this mainspring set on the winder here, and I'm just trying to set that hook into the um, into the spring. Once that's in, we uh, I'm using this winder here, and I tried my best to kind of give everyone a good view of winding this spring up. So uh, the arbor can be a little tricky on these, so you'll see me do that. But one thing I'd like to note here, um, these winders are really expensive. Uh, and, and the, the set of them is way more than I would ever be prepared to pay, especially as a hobbyist. But if you're piecing these together, it took me a while to reading through, but truly the only thing that is not, that is directional, uh, is the winding arbor itself. If you want a left or right, that's really the only piece out of these assemblies that you have to got, get a left or a right. And it is really unid unidirectional. The, um, the arbor itself or the, the, the housing, I guess, uh, where the spring sits inside. I'm sure I'm, I just massacred the correct terminology for it, but, uh, th those are, those will work for left or right rinders and the handles, you know, they sell a left hand wind and a right hand wind. But the truth be told is that you can use either one really. The, so if you want to, to, uh, to start piecing together a set, um, like I, I bought, uh, most 95% of the watches I work on can, work with a number five, six or seven size, um, winder, a Bergeon winder. So, uh, I bought left and right, uh, winding arbors, but the drums and then, uh, the handles, I mean, I just got the one, uh, and they work for both left and right hand. So you can save a significant amount of money by piecing it together. Um, and, uh, you know, if you buy that set, it's, it would be great to have, but, uh, you, a lot of it, you'll probably never even use. So, here I'm just putting uh, some Mobius 8200, just uh, three dots here on this spring. And that grease will work its way around as the watch uh, winds and unwinds. And it'll eventually get in there. Uh, if, if it was putting a new spring in, it would be pre-treated, but uh, uh, this used one here, we're relubricating it. So I'm putting this winder back in here and here we can get a close shot in as I set this winder in. You can kind of see that hook where right now it's, uh, there it is, it's not engaged with the spring. So I'm rotating that arbor around to the right until the right there where you see it finally set into that spring. And that's a really good view of what you're, of what you're looking for. So I'm using a little bit of HP 1300 here to uh, lubricate the shoulder. That's a pretty good shot there, if I may say so myself. And uh, then we're just going to put the cap on and then uh, press it down with our little handy dandy tool here that I'll show here in just a second, right here. And the cap on the underside of this, um, it, 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 it's, it's flush on the bottom. So it, it puts even pressure on that, uh, on that barrel lid when you put it in. A lot of times you'll hear a click. This one didn't, but I did check it just to make sure it's seated fully. And I'm just lubricating the shoulder on the other side. So next we're going to be doing the balance tools. And I did a really detailed video on every, on both upper and lower balance tool removals, uh, on that Pogue. On this video here, I didn't show me removing the jewel because you've probably seen that a hundred times. Uh, I do show the reinstall of that spring here, but I, I thought it would be better to show you kind of how I work on these jewels. Uh, I, I dipped them in some um, 
one dip to start. And then, uh, after that, I paused the video here so you can kind of see that spot in the center of that jewel. That's where some of the really dried on grease is. And, uh, you can use peg wood to, uh, to remove that. But I've, I've, I've spring, you know, I've, I've, I've shot a couple springs or, or jewels across the room before doing that. So what I really like to do is this is a little padded sanding stick. Uh, I think it's like 7,000 grit. But what I like to do is put the flat side of the jewel down uh, onto the paper and then uh, just use that stick to move it back and forth. And that does a really, really, really great job of scrubbing the, the face of that jewel. And then, uh, then after it's done, it goes back into the one dip for uh, another soak. And then uh, you can kind of see there that uh, that's done. There's, there's, there's tiny little marks around the radius of that. And that I was, I got in super, super tight with the microscope and was looking at it. And that's, uh, I think that's in manufacturer of the jewel itself. Uh, that was not dirt. So I'm using the automatic winder here. Once I reassemble the jewel into the, the capstone into its setting. And, uh, we'll get a close up shot here where you can see the oil ring that that left. And that's, uh, that one, that one looks great. Um, nice and circled in the center. I mean, it's, it hadn't worked. It's, uh, you know, when it's not correct, you'll definitely notice it. So we're setting this in place, uh, using some rod coat to handle the spring. And then uh, I like the two tweezer method here of putting these back in. Uh, some of the folks here, I see them, they can do these 10 times faster than I can. And they do them with one set of tweezers and uh, it's impressive. Uh, I'm clearly not as good as them, but this, the, you know, this way is safe for me. It works. And once it's in, I just clean it up with a bit of Rodico. I do the exact same thing to the other underside, uh, the jewel on the underside of the movement for the balance. Um, I just figured you didn't want to see the exact same thing twice. And then I'll just use a puff of air and just do a test and just let it spin and I'll time it. And, uh, I, again, I like them to go for, uh, at least 30 to 45 seconds. And again, this one here went a little bit longer. So this watch has diafix springs, uh, jewels, four of them, uh, two on the bridge, two on the main plate. And these can be buggers. Uh, these are, I, the, the bane of my, I love working on Seiko watches, but I hate doing these. It's the one thing on Seiko's I absolutely hate doing because this spring loves to get away from you and it will fly and you will never find it. I mean, if, if you do go buy lottery tickets because you are lucky, but, um, I flattened some pegwood here to hold it down. And I wanted to show you the removal. Uh, once that's in this place here, this is where I like to get it. I'll use pegwood to clean it and I'll clean it just like you saw me do the balance jewels and I'll reassemble it by pressing that spring back down, holding it down with pegwood and the juice using my oiler to get that, uh, the head of that spring in place. And, um, so I did that four times in total and that took a good amount of time. And I even had one spring go flying on me. And later on, you'll see in this, uh, in this video where one of those springs is a gold colored spring. Cause I had to get into my parts bin to get one because I did lose one and it's not, not difficult to do at all. Uh, even now, uh, it's been a long time since I've had a part go flying, but that one flew on me. So I'm using my automatic oiler here and, uh, I didn't lubricate those springs or those springs, those jewels when I installed them. If you have an automatic oiler or you can use a, a needle oiler, uh, a manual needle or oiler, basically the same thing as this, but a manual one, and you can lubricate those from the other side. And here it was kind of tough getting both of those in focus because we're zoomed in so tight, but, uh, we got all those jewels oiled. And lastly, uh, after we clean this one, this is the, uh, the top jewel for the, uh, center wheel bridge. Uh, this is held on by one screw and that is a just ridiculously tiny screw. Uh, probably second only maybe to the, you know, the stud screw on the balance assembly. I mean, that that's a, probably the second smallest screw in the entire watch. And we're, we're not even going to mess with that other one because we didn't need to. So now with all that out of the way, we can actually begin assembly of the watch. And that begins with the center wheel. So I like, um, lubricating the wheel before I put it in both top and bottom. Um, I mean, I, it would be easier on me if I would lubricate the, the top of that once I put the wheel in place here, cause it'd be a lot easier, but you know, hindsight is 2020, I suppose. So with that out of the way, we can install the center wheel bridge back into place and we'll get that one single screw in again. Uh, just make sure if you do kind of mix your screws in together, make sure that you, the screw you put in here is the, the one with the, the, um, the top that's a bit rounded. Uh, the other one will be a countersunk screw with a perfectly flat top, uh, for the pallet wheel bridge. So once that's in place here, I'm just checking in shake just to make sure that, um, I didn't really have a problem during disassembly, but after cleaning and this is final assembly, just check it, 
you know, before it goes in just to make sure it's good and that you're not going to have any problems. So, uh, I'm, we lubricated the underside of the lip on that, but here we're just lubricating the, uh, the Arbor itself where it goes into the, the main plate. So we're going to get the, um, the mainspring barrel in place, give that a little spin, just make sure it's, everything's good to go and, uh, keep moving forward here. I'll uh, do a little bit of lubrication here before I put the bridge on. You can lubricate it again after you put the bridge on. It really doesn't matter. I just like doing it this way, and I think it makes for a better video uh, where you can where you can see that going on. And here I'm putting a little bit of grease in there for the um, the setting lever actual screw. Uh, I, I'd have to refer to the manual see what the technical term for it, but I think you all know what part I'm talking about. So now we're going to begin with the rest of the wheel train. Uh, this is the third wheel. So be very careful when you're putting these in. Um, it's uh, just, it's, it has to engage the teeth uh, with that, uh, that second wheel. And it, it, sometimes it can be troublesome to get into place, but just make sure that's fully down. Uh, after that, we put in the escape wheel there. And now I'm just uh, oiling the, uh, the uh, pivot on right there where that, uh, where that fifth wheel is going to go into place and uh, just let gravity do its job here. When you put these in, don't force these down. Just kind of nudge them a little bit until gravity puts them down in there, and that way you don't risk damaging the wheel. And I'm just kind of adjusting that escape wheel a little bit. But after these are in, now it's time to install the bridge. We'll start off here. Uh, we kind of get the bridge in place. I kind of got lucky there. That thing kind of just dropped right in. Uh, that that was my first attempt at it too. I mean, I kind of got lucky. But once that gets put in place, I I do the little uh, the trick here and. The, the trick to making this work is you don't want to hold your movement holder sturdy. You want it to kind of bounce around a little bit while you're tapping it to allow those pivots to move around. And um, that thing, I mean, pivots fell right into place. And uh, again, I mean, no editing tricks here. It really is. I mean, it, it doesn't always work that well, but that one really did work that great. So um, what we'll do is we'll start by putting the screws in. And I'm not going to torque them down just yet. I'm just going to get them basically to where they, they're all the way down, but completely untorqued. And, uh, that way in case anything does move around a little bit, I'm not taking any chances on breaking any pivots. And I'm back to the same challenge that we had as before, where do you want awkward silence during these moments of me just screwing in screws? Or do you want me to just give you some quick anecdote about the movement or the history of the watch? Um, either way is fine with me. It's just, uh, you know, I gotta figure out something to do while you just watch me put in screws. But, uh, once those are in, uh, we check the movement of the wheel train again, just to make sure everything's good and do a final torque on these three screws for the, uh, for the bridge. Once that's out of the way, the next step in assembly is to install the click spring. Uh, this near is basically the exact same click spring. Uh, slightly different shape. I mean, they're not interchangeable with the Pogue, but it's the same design. So um, sometimes getting these screws started can be a bit of a pain, but uh, uh, sometimes they go in easy and sometimes, you know, that, that click spring will move around or something. But, um, you know, we got that thing in. And next is the ratchet wheel. Uh, just make sure that the ratchet wheel, you know, you get that set in on top of the barrel arbor and you also make sure the click spring is where it needs to be. And it's held on by this one screw. We'll screw it down. Uh, you can see the movement, you know, the gear train turning there. We'll screw it down until uh, we get to the end. But in order to torque it down, you need to hold that ratchet wheel still. So just use that plastic tool if you're doing this, just to make sure you don't damage any teeth. Then I'll uh, put a little bit of wind in it and I check the movement of the wheel train, uh, just letting it, everything kind of do full rotations, make sure there's, you know, damaged teeth I didn't miss or, you know, just something in out of place. And then I'm just using my fine tip oiler here to uh, check in shake on all the wheels. And, uh, I like that fine tip oiler. I use that 99% of the time, regardless of what I'm working on on a watch. I just like the fine tip oiler. Um, you know, I, I bought the set originally. It came with four different sizes and I don't think I've ever even opened up the package on two of them. But, uh, once the pallet fork is in, you know, in place somewhat, uh, again, uh, I'll reiterate just like the last video, use very, very, very light pressure. And, uh, until you get this set in place and right there, you just saw that, that, uh, that pallet wheel, the, the pallet fork bridge set down and, uh, seat securely. 
So we'll put this in here with that flat skirted, flat headed screw that we described earlier. Um, once that's in place and torqued down, just, well, wait, no, yes. Yeah, right there. So once that's done, we can put a wind and watch, not a full wind, just a little bit. And uh, right here, I'm uh, just checking a few things just to make sure that the energy is being transferred through the wheel train and that pallet fork is acting as you see here. I'm also looking at the engagement on the pallet fork with the escape wheel. And now we can lubricate the escapement itself. So uh, I really tried my best to uh, do a better job than I did in the last video. And as I say that, uh, <laughs> the camera, you know, the, the image is going down, but uh, it, I managed to keep this one in frame. But we'll put a little bit of, um, this is Mobius 9415 on the, on the edge of that exit stone. And then I'll get my brass tweezers in here and I'll slowly uh, move that pallet fork back and forth and it will apply that lubrication to the uh, to the edges of five escape wheel teeth. Because this is an 18,000 beats per hour movement, so there's 15 teeth on that escape wheel, so we will do this lubrication process three times. And we'll put another small dab of 9415 on that, uh, on that escape wheel, and this is all one shot uh, on each of these stages. Uh, so uh, I was really, and I have to hold this at a 45 degree angle to my microscopes to get this view. So it was really difficult to film this. But uh, uh, I, I think we did a pretty good job of uh, showing the process. And on this one, I also must say that I didn't make the same mistake as last time. And uh, I didn't get any grease on the, uh, on the tops or other edges of that, uh, of that exit stone. And uh, so after we get those five teeth, we rotate this around. And uh, once that's in place, it's time to install the balance. So here we are installing the balance. And uh, one thing I've always noted, especially when I when I first began working on watches, I would see people put in balance a balance like this, and then they'd rotate it around. And uh, I would see them doing it one way or the other, but didn't understand why they rotated it in one direction or another. Um, it's pretty simple once you're actually looking at it to see, but it all depends upon uh, at which stop the pallet fork is, uh, and how the impulse jewel on the underside of that balance assembly, if it needs to come in from the right side or the left side. And, um, if you know which way you want to spin the balance, you can, you know, adjust, you, you can set it up accordingly. That way you can, you can kind of spin that balance in. But when I put this in, you, you saw it first where that balance did not in, initially engage. And that was because, uh, of that exact thing I was saying earlier, where, that impulse jewel, when I finally got the balance set in place, was on the outside of the horn on the pallet fork. So there's two ways you can fix that. You can either remove the balance and then reinstall it, or if you haven't, you know, if it's not fully all the way down, you can use just the gentlest amount of pressure and lift up that balance assembly and rotate it over the pallet fork and then set it back down. And that balance will come in from the other direction and engage in the pallet fork. So uh, right here, what I'm doing, I, I was kind of fully in, engrossed in the work and honestly didn't pay attention to the focus on the camera. But when I put the balance in and I put a wind in the watch, I noticed that the hairspring was tilted high on once. From this view, it would have been the right side where the spring was kind of tilting upwards. So what I'm doing here is, is uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the most gentle fashion I possibly can, um, kind of just uh, adjusting it right at the, um, uh, right at the stud, uh, to get that spring in line. And I, and I got it. I mean, and, and now it's, it's dead flat again. I am really sorry for that being out of focus, but I started working on it and I kind of got back into the mode where I used to be before I recorded these, where I can see it perfectly clear through, through the microscope, but the camera has its own focus. And so it was out of whack, but once that's in, uh, this is the initial time graph we're reading after it'd been running for about 25 minutes or so. Again, this is not final at all, but uh, amplitude's great and it's going to rise. Beat error, I got fixed. It was down to about two seconds, but that, that will change over time. But that's a good base reading. And those trace lines actually will clean up quite a bit uh, after you let that watch run in and that lubrication will settle in. So we're beginning movement here by um, on the dial side of the watch by applying a little bit of grease and then putting in the setting lever. Once that's in place, we're going to uh, put that little holder spring down. And, uh, again, that's just for, um, when you press the button on the other side to release a setting lever, that's the spring that pushes it back into place, uh, after you put that in. So we'll, uh, we'll screw that 
particular piece down. Right there, and now um, shaky hands and all. This is another part of the video where I noticed I was I was shaky. I was I was hungry, or I had a shoulder and I had a bunch of sugar in my system or something. I don't know. But um, applying lubrication to the uh, the stem and that lubrication you can see on the very far right hand side that was unnecessary. I didn't even need to put it there. Uh, before everything was said and done, I did clean that grease off, but, um, uh, but, uh, yeah, applying it to each four sides where it engages with the clutch wheel and a little bit right on the tip. And then we'll put this in place. And again, uh, so when I'm putting this, uh, this stem in, it didn't want to go in all the way. And so, uh, what I had to do here is I'll flip the movement over while I'm holding that stem in, I'll press down on that spring. And then, uh, hitting that in, then that, that allowed the stem to go in and, and lock into place right where it needed to be. So here I am applying a little bit of grease here to the clutch wheel and the engagement point for the yoke where it goes in the clutch wheel is not in the flat part of that resets. It's actually on the walls and that's where it's going to rub. So, I mean, if you can manage to just grease the walls, technically that is all you need, but um, it doesn't hurt anything. So that's why I did it. And on the setting lever itself, I am applying some uh, some grease to the contact points where the yoke is going to rub against it. You could also grease the tip of the yoke itself, uh, but I mean, it's just easy for me to do it right there uh, to grease that point. But um, you get the yoke set into the clutch wheel right there, and you can kind of see right there where it hits into that, uh, that setting lever. So now we're installing the yoke spring. Just kind of get uh, kind of a, a, a flat, shaped tool here, uh, plastic preferably so it doesn't scratch up anything. And then uh, you can, you can put tension on that spring. Next up, I'm, I'm just using a little bit of grease here to grease the point where it contacts the yoke itself and just using a bit of Rotico just to do some cleanup on some of the parts. I'm, I'm applying some HP 1300 here on this little post here. Uh, that post is going to be part of where that quick set mechanism is. I'm applying some 9010. Uh, right there into the quick, quick set mechanism. And this is more 1300 on the other post where the quick set goes. And it connects between that post and that one we just lubricated a moment ago on the yoke. Once that is done, we can then, uh, we're going to lubricate the uh, setting lever spring. Uh, you could do these while it's on there too. I, I really just like doing it this way. I, I find it much easier. Although normally when I'm not, I have my, you know, something holding it, but for the purposes of filming, so you can see what I'm doing, I'm not, the part's kind of moving around because I'm not holding it down. But uh, if you're doing this yourself, you know, you don't have to, you can have something there to make it easy. So we install that setting lever spring and then that plate that uh, holds down the quick set. And then we have that shouldered screw that holds everything in place. So we'll get that down. And once we get that down and torqued, we can just kind of give everything a little bit of, te of a test. We'll, uh, right there. So here uh, I'm just testing, I'm pulling the, the crown out into each position, uh, turning it just to make sure that everything's functioning as it should, that everything feels right, nothing's binding. And uh, you, you know, it's a very tactile thing. You'll know when something's wrong. But once that's done, I clean it up with a bit of Rotico, get rid of all that excess grease. And that way really, the, there's just a very, very thin film of grease inside that setting lever spring, inside the grooves where the setting lever itself engages. And that's really what you want. You don't want all that excess grease when everything's said and done. So here I am uh, applying a little bit of grease here for the cannon pinion. This one here is a press fit, just like most of them. But when we get into some of like the ETA movements and some of the other stuff later, uh, there are different ways of, of doing it. And uh, some future videos will definitely show that. Applying a little bit of 1300 here, we're gonna install the minute wheel. And you kind of have to install this thing at a little bit of an angle. It may have been easier to install the minute wheel before we set in the quick set date because you can see it sits underneath that, that little rotating star that engages the day wheel and uh, the date wheel, but um, that gets in place. A uh, little bit of 1300 here for the assembly of the calendar works. Uh, that's the date driving wheel going into place first. And then on top of that, then we have the uh, day driving wheel. And there is a shouldered screw that holds that whole assembly into place. Again, uh, compliments to Seiko on making this as simple as they do, but yet it's still, I've worked on watches that have my, many more parts than this that don't accomplish anything more than what those three pieces do. Once that's done, we're applying a little bit of HP 1300 here. Uh, applied it to the post for the intermediate wheel that I'm putting on here. Um, 
the smaller set of gears on the inside are what engages with the date wheel. The, the, the wider set of gears are engaged with the hour wheel. So that gets in and make sure that it's, uh, when you put that hour wheel in, that it's meshed in with the teeth on both that intermediate wheel and the um, minute wheel. So now we're installing the um, day corrector, the day setting lever, uh, apply a little bit of lubrication to that hole where that goes. And then we have that one screw we kind of detailed earlier that's unique to that position. But you'll notice even when that screw tightened down fully, that wheel still has movement. Next up is the cover plate for the minute wheel. And it's held on by one screw as well. Um, again, uh, that minute wheel, the, the, the whole purpose of that cover plate is to keep that minute wheel from rising up. If that cover plate wasn't there, that minute wheel likes to rise up a little bit. And if it does, it'll take the hour wheel along with it. So um, that's the, kind of the entire function of that is just to keep that sitting downwards and flush. Next up is the uh, the setting lever for the day, uh, the date wheel. The setting lever itself goes in. Uh, we're just going to place the spring in here, but we can't put tension on it yet because we have to have the uh, date wheel in place first. That setting lever has to be sitting against something in order for the spring to be set in. So we'll get that setting lever, or excuse me, the, uh, the day wheel set in place. Once that's in, we can kind of move that setting lever around right here and kind of engage it and just kind of get it set in between a couple teeth. Once that's done, we can use our little flat plastic tool here. And uh, these have a tendency to go flying. So just take your time and uh, make sure that both sides of the spring are set fully down. Um, yeah, right there, you can kind of see it. It didn't kind of go down fully at first. And then uh, once you get kind of both pieces in here, just kind of make sure everything's in place before you lift that up. Because if you, at this point, if you just barely bump the watch, that spring is gone and uh, good luck ever finding it. So even for lubrication, what I'm doing here, I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm holding that in place. And even still after this lubrication, I'll take a bit of Rodico and just kind of clean up a tiny bit of, uh, of uh, grease that's still in that lever or, or, or oil that's still in that lever. And uh, just be very aware at this point here, it's playing with fire uh, <laughs> until you get this cover plate in place. So, I probably should have picked a different medium to, to do this on because I mean, it looks filthy, but, uh, this spring here, um, you know, you're supposed to put it, put it on this plate here before you install it. I've seen one video where a guy was able to put the plate on and then slide the spring in afterwards. I tried it that way and I lost the spring. So I've, um, hold your breath, but do it this way. Cause if you bump that spring, it's gone. So be very careful putting this part in at first. And that spring doesn't have to be in place. But you are just you're you're just make sure you give it the your full attention and get this plate set in place very gingerly, and then get a couple screws started, but not tighten down all the way. Um, doing your best not to bump that plate. But uh, once we get those two screws in, which uh, you know next time I do this, I'll shorten the edit where you don't have to see me screwing down every single screw. But yeah, I mean you do see them going in. But um, once this plate gets in, we can. Tighten these down just, just to start. And now we can put tension on that screw. But, uh, and FYI, uh, after I got this on this plate, I did go over it with Rodico and just to make sure there was no dust or anything, but, uh, you need a hard surface when you put that spring in. And my, my mat, that green mat has a little bit of, uh, uh, uh of, of a pad underneath it. So you need a kind of a hard surface when you put that spring on. Otherwise, when you release it, uh, at least, you know, your tool off of it, it'll go flying. But uh, once that's in, we put in the uh, the uh, cover plate up top here that captures the, um, the teeth on that uh, date wheel, just like that other plate does. But once that's in place and we get everything torqued down, now I'm just applying just a very sm small amount of Mobius 9010 to the uh, date wheel lever. Uh, it does not take much at all. Uh, just don't over oil it. But uh, when you do that, uh, now I'm just uh, testing the function and rotating that wheel around a few times just to distribute that, just to get a very, very, very light film of oil on the teeth of that wheel. And with that done, the next step is to install the day wheel. This day wheel here does not, is not held in by a clip like you saw in my previous videos, or I'm sure you've seen in others, but uh, you, you get it in place, then you can see where it indexes into each position when it's indexing with that lever uh, that we installed earlier. So we put on a replacement dial washer and now we're putting in the dial spacer. Um, dial washers are, I mean, th those aren't really specific. You can buy assortments of those for pennies. And um, 
just find one that fits. I mean, but it, those are not difficult to source. So we put the dial on and then uh, we tightened down the two dial feet screws, but I didn't show them. These are the original hands and I'm doing my best here just to try to clean them up some, but some, but I really wasn't happy with the condition that they were in. I really liked the old loom cause that loom is aged really well. But as you can see here, you know, close ups of both the hour wheel or the hour hand and the minute hand, they're just not that great. Um, I just, uh, I didn't really like how these turned out. So I decided to, to, to use a different set of hands, uh, that actually came off of a, uh, a, uh, the same exact movement on a, uh, a part watch. I had my, have had my parts been for a while, but you can see these, these hands I'm putting on here, a little bit different design, but, um, same era. Again, I'm not too concerned about this watch being original. It's not necessarily, you know, it's not a necessarily valuable watch. It's just, this is a personal project and kind of the, the whole point of, I wanted to make this series was, uh, you know, watches that you can buy for not a whole lot of money, but are cool. You know, they have their vintage and, uh, you know, they, it's not the end of the world if it doesn't have the original hands on it. So, uh, but again, uh, I kind of went through the installation of those hands pretty quickly, but here I'm just doing a final press in of the, uh, the seconds hand. And, uh, I, I went over the dial with some, uh, with some Rodico and then, uh, I also kind of, you know, off camera, I went over it with a, a, a very soft little cotton swab and like one of those little gel sponge things and, uh, clean it up the best I could. So now we're installing a new crystal here. we got the crystal set in, uh, we have the bezel put on there and, uh, the crystal kind of fits over a lip and then the bezel applies the final tension on it. So we got it set between some plastic here. And unlike the previous watch where it clips in place, this bezel here is just a, you know, you press it in and then you rotate it around. Uh, and then you just, you know, make sure you get even pressure across all sides of it. Uh, I'd really like to get a rover press, but I mean, they are kind of expensive, but, uh, thus far that cheap little press I have has done almost everything I needed it to do. So I, I haven't been able to justify spending a few hundred dollars on a rover press, even though I'd love to have one, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a want and not a need thing. Cause I'm getting by with, uh, you know, I've got some expensive tools and some cheap tools and that cheap tool still seems to get the job done for me. So here we're installing the automatic winding works. Uh, I've already put the transmission wheel in place and lubricated it. Uh, put a little lubrication on the stud there for the paw lever, holding the paw lever down. I'm just getting the teeth set in place. And then, uh, we will put on those two cover plates. Uh, this one here is a transmission wheel cover plate held on by one screw. And the screw for this plate is different than the screws for the paw lever cover plate. Uh, you can mix these together in a parts bin, but you'll have two of one and one of another. So it's not very difficult to make sure you get the right screws in the right spot. But, uh, while you're seeing me put this together, it is worth noting, uh, it's not on camera here, but I did put, uh, some, uh, a little bit of oil on each side of that transmission lever, uh, later on after I got it mounted or the transmission wheel after I got it mounted. And I, I worked that around by, uh, rotating the auto winding mechanism. So even though that particular piece is not on camera as it would have been later in the assembly process, it's not shown, but it did get done. But, um, again, those, uh, you know, just these couple parts here, that's, that's it to the, to that. So, um, we're going to get this automatic winding, assembly set in place here, uh, hold it down a little bit. And you want to make sure that, uh, it's engaged properly with the movement. So you rotate it around a little bit until you, you know, you'll see that, uh, ratchet wheels start to spin when I'm rotating this. And that tells you that everything's in place. It's held on by three screws. Uh, and oddly enough, as much as I talked about it earlier, uh, I, I mean, I, I cut this down. You see me put in the one screw here and tighten it down, but I did put in all three. I just didn't waste your time showing all that, but after that's done, we uh, put in our repaired oscillating weight and uh, we'll get it tightened down. And I'm, I'm just showing you here, uh, use this little plastic tool here to stop the movement of it. And that allows you to put the, uh, the torque you need on the screen. It doesn't take a lot of torque, but that allows you to torque it down. And I'll pause the video here because I'm about to put the back plate on the swatch, but I did put in the, you know, the, the, uh, the movement ring, the, uh, a new gasket and the crown. I don't know what happened to that footage. I apologize, but all that did get in and that, that stem got a brand new gasket. Um, and that, and the, uh, case back gasket were both, uh, treated with silicone grease. So here I'm, uh, putting this on the, the my case back opening and closing tool. 
covering this with uh, just some plastic so I don't take a chance on scratching the watch. Again, there is some scratches in it already, uh, not many. I did actually go over this case a little bit. I didn't sand it or anything, and I didn't buff it, but I did uh, take some red rouge and uh, slightly polish it a little bit. But uh, that red rouge is about as light as you can get. I mean, all the, all the lines are still super crisp, but it just shines up the watch a little bit and makes it look nice. So um, I kind of have large wrists, so I'm putting some uh, an XL length strap on this one so that I can wear it. Generally, um, you know, uh, there's not a watch I get where almost not a watch I get where the factory bracelet or factory strap actually fits me. Uh, but, um, so you can see there, it's an XL length strap, but, um, nothing fancy, just a, a simple strap. Um, they're relatively inexpensive, uh, but we'll get this set in place here. Uh, I kind of have to fiddle with this one a little bit to get that, uh, that new spring bar. And yes, I did put new spring bars in this to get that spring bar to set in place. But then here, that watch was basically done. So I got a few photos of it here, uh, just, uh, you know, in my driveway before I pulled out to work and uh, to go to work and just a few uh, simple photos here of just me wearing the watch here. Nothing fancy or extra special. Just wanted you to see it. Uh, took a trip into outer space here uh, last week. So, you know, that was fun to have that watch with me there. And I got one more here. Uh, that was, I think I was on a break at work or something, but... Uh, that's it. I think the watch turned out really well, and I sure hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, I'd really appreciate it if you liked and subscribed and maybe left a comment below, and we will see you on the next one. Thanks again.